My name is Pastor Rob Squinsberg. For some of you who may be joining us for the first time, I am in the middle of teaching the book of Genesis. Our Bible study group obviously is not able to meet around these tables, and so we thank God for the technology that allows uh, the continual preaching and teaching of God's Word uh, in these days. So I'm going to pick it up from chapter 27. Uh, verse 30, we've been talking about Jacob and Esau. And just for those of you who may be joining me for the first time, uh, Esau has sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob deceived his father Isaac to get the blessing. And in biblical days, the birthright and the blessing, they were very significant because that was a position of authority and power in the household. It was also a double inheritance, a double portion of the inheritance. And so we've reached the point where Esau has lost his birthright. He sold his birthright. Jacob has deceived Isaac into thinking that he was Esau. He received the blessing. And so we pick it up from chapter 27, verse 30. Let us hear the word of God. Now it came about that as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had already gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. And then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me, that I ate of all of it before you, and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, bless even me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. So I want to stop there for a second and talk about the fact that uh, Jacob uh, had taken uh, the blessing from Isaac. Isaac could not give a second blessing. It was the blessing of the father upon the firstborn, and once that was done, that could not be retracted. And so Esau comes in after hunting, and he is surprised to find that his father Isaac had already given the blessing. And so he is tremendously upset uh, about this. And uh, you, you notice it says that Esau said he took away my blessing. Well, as we go back, we know that he really didn't take it away. Uh, Esau sold his birthright for some stew that Jacob had made. So Esau is feeling sorry for himself. He has realized now that he has lost both the birthright and now the blessing. And so, in, as we continue here, he says, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and all of his relatives I have given to him as servants with grain and new wine. I have sustained him. Now as for you, what can I do, my son? And Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. So Esau lifted his voice, and he wept. So Esau is feeling sorry uh, for himself. So Esau lost the blessing. He sold his birthright. And you know, that reminds me of a lot of Christians who perhaps uh, sell things in their lives, lose things in their lives, looking at the material, 
looking at the temporary rather than the big picture. We've talked about this before, that Esau was short-sighted and that he didn't think about the consequences of his actions. And I think that's true of many people today, and I think it's true of many Christians, that we, we sell ourselves short and we sell God short by giving up things that we don't think we need or things that we don't want, but not realizing the consequences of those actions. And so Esau had good intentions. Uh, he had good wishes, but he made wrong choices. You know, the Bible says that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so in the eyes of God, having good intentions is not enough. It's about being obedient. It's about being faithful. It's about being consistent in our Christian walk. And it's a matter of making right choices and right decisions. And all of us in our lives have made wrong decisions. We wish we could go back and, and remake some of those decisions. But thankfully, God in his grace and in his mercy forgives us and we're able to move forward. Hopefully we learn from those mistakes and we don't continue uh, to do them. Esau deserves, excuse me, Jacob in his deceit really deserves punishment. You know, we've talked about this before in our Bible study that Abraham lies to the king of Egypt saying that Sarah was his sister. And in return, he gets blessed and he gets sent away from the country with all these goodies. And he lies a second time and yet he is blessed. Here we have another situation where Jacob is very deceitful, he's very dishonest, and he tricks his brother out of the birthright and the blessing, and um, he really does some bad things. And yet we're gonna see that God blesses him. And as I've wrestled with that over the years, I've come to think, well, why is that? If he does something wrong, why is he being blessed like this? And I really have come up with what I believe to be the truth of God's word in this, in that we are blessed in spite of our failures, in spite of the bad things that we do. And that's God's grace and his mercy. So we are reminded of that very much through the story of Jacob and Esau. Notice that Esau also is very selfish and self-centered. Uh, the first thing he says to his father, uh, well, what can you give me? What, well, what can you give me? Since you've already blessed Jacob, is there anything left for me? Very self-centered and uh, really didn't feel sorry or any remorse at all uh, for his actions. He didn't take any responsibility for his actions and yet is seeking the favor of Isaac, his father. So let's continue as we read. Verse 38, Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me. And so Esau lifted up his voice and he wept. And then Isaac, his father, said to him, behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it comes about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. And so there's a prophecy here as we looked at the two lines of Cain and Abel, how Cain killed his brother Abel. Uh, Cain made poor choices and he went down that road. Uh, Esau makes poor choices here. He will pay consequently uh, down the road. And there is a prophecy here that the descendants of Esau will serve Jacob and his descendants. They are to be servants. And this is not at all what Esau had planned. However, it had been God's plan that Jacob would be the one through whom the line, the blessed line, would come. And so we see this prediction that because of his poor choices, there will be consequences down the road. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessings which his father had blessed him. Now, he bore a grudge, but he didn't realize 
he was partly responsible for this. And I think about grudges in people's lives. I think about the people that have done things wrong to you. And we can think back in our lives. Maybe it was a parent or a brother or a friend. And God calls us to forgive. We are not to hold grudges against people. God's word says that we are to forgive as we are forgiven. And so one of the hardest things for us to do is to forgive people when they have wronged us. And actually the, the circumstance of betrayal in life, and some of you have gone through this in your lives, where someone has betrayed you, they've betrayed your trust, that is a very, very difficult mountain to climb. And there are often feelings of uh, anger and uh, being revengeful upon people. And God does not want us to respond in that way. God wants us to uh, forgive them and have mercy upon them. Because after all, we, we receive mercy from God and God wants us to extend mercy from others. So when we talk about mercy, mercy is not receiving what we deserve. I preached a sermon one time entitled, Getting What You Deserve. Had a lot of people interested in that title. But then by the end of the sermon, they weren't quite so sure. Because if we truly get what we deserve from God, due to our sin and our rebellion and failure to follow him, we would not be happy. So again, in the story of Jacob, Jacob does not get what he deserves. He deserves the punishment, the wrath, for being deceitful and for tricking his brother and for lying to his father about who he was. But God in his grace, grace is undeserved favor. So we often talk about grace and mercy. Grace is receiving something that you do not deserve, whereas mercy is not getting what you deserve, you see? So there's a difference between those terms that we need to understand. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he's waiting for the death of his father, not concerned that his father will soon be passed, no longer be able to talk to his father, no longer able to prepare food for his father, to go hunting for his father. But you see a total self selfishness and self-centeredness here. And I see it in, in the lives of people. I see it in my own life at times, how easy it is to be so self-centered and self-absorbent. Um, I was talking to a lady the other day whose son, who was a senior in high school, and this coronavirus has kind of changed his world as it's changed all of our worlds. And it was interesting, she was telling me that he's no longer able to play baseball, he's no longer going to be able to go to prom, he's no longer going to be able to get his diploma. And it's interesting, in 18-year-old's perspective, uh, his world has been shattered. And I guess maybe only as we grow older do we learn these things. And yes, all of these things are disappointments. We mustn't downplay these disappointments. But, but folks, we're going to experience a lot more in life than some of these disappointments. We're going to really go through challenges and tests in our lives that are going to really uh, allow God to know and for us and others to know what we're made of and are we able to go through this. And so, you know, instead of thinking about poor me, and how this coronavirus affects me and my family, we need to be thinking about others. We need to be thinking about those doctors and nurses who are literally putting their lives on, their line, on the line each day. We need to be thinking about the doctors and the scientists, the people seeking to bring uh, a cure for this, and we need to pray for them and be concerned for them. And so one of the things we need to do is to stop being so self-centered and to put our eyes upon others, to pray for others, to think about others, and to help others. And I think one good thing that is coming out in all this is that many people are actually able to do this. And so notice here that murder begins in the mind of Esau. He begins by thinking about it. You know, in the New Testament, 
God's word talks about sin and about how the process of sin begins in the heart. And then it gets going in the mind and we start thinking about it. And then God's word says that when these things are uh, completed and that we, it gives birth to sin, that sin is the result of all these things. And so the wickedness of murder begins in the heart of Esau, as it began earlier in Genesis, uh, in the mind and in the heart of Cain, who was disappointed that God did not accept his offering, but he accepted Abel's offering. So it begins here in his mind where he says, you know what? The days are coming. The days are coming when my father will die, and then, Jacob, you better look out because I'm coming for you. Now, when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob, and she said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Isn't that interesting? He's consoling himself by seeking to kill him. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise and flee to Haran to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Now, this is another case where Rebecca is asking her son to obey him. And I think that that was good advice at the time. But remember, back when Esau was out hunting food for his father. It was Rebekah who said to Jacob, listen, I have a plan. Put on the clothes of Esau. I'm going to cook up some stew and you go and you pretend to be Esau. And it says that, that Esau listened, listened to the voice. Excuse me, Jacob listened to the voice of his mother. This time, she gives him some good advice. Uh, she is concerned for his well-being. Uh, however, we don't see in here in the life of Rebecca, and we don't see here in the life of Jacob, any repentance. We don't see any remorse for what they've done, but we see further planning and further scheming. And so she instructs Jacob to go to her uncle Laban's house. Until your brother's anger against you subsides and he will forget what you did to him. Well, that may be wishful thinking, right? When somebody does something terrible to you, sometimes that's hard to get rid of. And here's the thing that I found with a lot of people. You know, we always, we all get angry and upset at times in life. And I had a couple of cases where people have gotten angry uh, at me. And I remember a number of years ago uh, in a church where the session had decided to sell some pews from our old sanctuary because the building wasn't being used. We had a new sanctuary now, and the old building, we couldn't hold meetings or youth groups meetings or anything there. And so the session sold the pews. And there was a gentleman who um, was very, very angry, very upset with me. And before the service one day, just really uh, was very, very uh, angry and said some terrible words. And uh, right after the service, I emailed him and said, look, let's get together, let's talk about this. And my hope was that as the weeks would go on, that his anger would subside. But you know what, it didn't. As each week went by, he got angrier and angrier began to draw other people into this. It was a real mess, it really created uh, a lot of problems. But to be angry initially at something, we all have gone through that, that's normal. To hold on to that anger and to allow that anger to interfere with our daily lives, that, that is another thing. So Rebecca thinks there's gonna come a time when Esau is going to uh, forget about what Jacob had done to him. That's not gonna happen. Let's continue. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Why should I be bereaved of you both in, in one day? You know, it's a sad thing that Rebecca uh, now has 
put herself in a position where she has sent her son away. So she is estranged to her son, Jacob, who has committed these things. Esau is all upset. And the relationship in the family between Esau and his father and his mother, uh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure Esau said, Mom, did you know anything about this? Mom, what did you know about this? And so she really lost both sons in this. I think back, uh, some of you may know the uh, story several years ago in Florida of uh, Casey Anthony, who, whose daughter Kaylee uh, was murdered, a beautiful little girl. And Casey, the young mother, was put on trial. And there was a very interesting point in the trial where the mother of Casey was asked to testify. And it had to do with some things that were looked up on Google on her computer at home. And uh, I think the family knew, most of the people knew that Casey had been involved in this. And so on the witness stand, Casey's mother said that on such and such a date at such and such a time that she had been on the computer from home. Well, it turned out that she really perjured herself uh, from her work records. It, it came to be that she was actually at work uh, when this happened. And as I thought about that, I thought to myself, it was wrong for her to lie about it. But then I started to think, look, she's lost her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, beautiful little granddaughter, is dead. Her daughter is on trial for murder. And her daughter, if she is convicted, at the very least, will be sent away forever. At the worst, could receive the death penalty. And so I felt very, very sorry for her because here she had lost a granddaughter who was dead um, and in many ways, she lost her daughter, uh, who was alive. The relationship there was uh, very much damaged and uh, just a very horrible story. That's what sin does. It ruins our relationships with one another. And when we have a falling out with someone, God's word says that we are to immediately go and make things right with that person. God's word says, do not allow the sun to go down on your, on your wrath with someone, that we are to attend to it um, immediately. And so we see a family here in disarray. We see a family in chaos. Isaac is old. He's getting ready to die. Estranged from his son Esau. Estranged from his son Jacob. Physically, uh, Jacob is far from him. Emotionally, uh, not physically, but emotionally, his son Esau, which has stayed. Very, very tragic story, and hopefully we can learn from these things. Verse 46, Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like bees, from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? And so she's concerned about losing her son, Jacob. She's also facing the reality that as her children grow, that they will leave, that they will marry, that they will go away. And so uh, Rebecca now is beginning to experience some of the consequences that she didn't think about when she originally had this plan to deceive Isaac. She didn't see down the road how this was going to affect her and her sons. So basically that's the uh, end of the 27th chapter. We're going to get started just a little bit into the 28th chapter before we uh, end today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I just want to say that as we conclude the 27th chapter, again, we see the way, the way of Esau and the way of Jacob. And we see that God blessing Jacob in spite of uh, his sins. There's an interesting verse in Romans chapter 9, verse 12 and 13. Not by works, but by him who calls, 
she was told, the older will serve the younger. This is the story of, of Jacob and Esau. And of course, the older child, when Jacob and Esau were born, Esau was the firstborn. And if we go back and we look at that story in previous chapters, even in the womb, as Esau was being born, baby Jacob had his hand on the heel of Esau. In other words, I want have one out first. I want to be the firstborn. But there is this prophecy that the older will serve the younger. I always say, if you want to know how God works, just figure out how you would do things and then realize that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. But there's an interesting passage here that I want to clarify. She says, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And we often look at that verse and we think, oh my gosh, I didn't think we were supposed to hate. Well, this is a time to share with you a little bit about the difference in languages and the meaning and interpretation of words. Because in the Old Testament, there is this contrast between light and darkness, between good and evil. Uh, however, when God is talking, and this is a quote, by the way, of, from God, it's not from Paul, it's not from Isaac or Rebekah, but that portion of that verse, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated, are words from God. And actually, it's just a contrast in meaning. It's not saying that God actually hates Esau and loves Jacob, but that it's in comparison that Jacob is the one that God has his hand upon. Jacob is the one who would lead the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel would come from Jacob later through Joseph. And so it's just a contrast. And by the way, we use that word hated a lot, right? Don't we in our society? Maybe too much. You know, oh, I hated that football game, you know, or... Um, I just hate it when somebody cuts in front of me in line. Well, we don't actually mean that. At least I hope we don't mean that. But there's an interesting uh, passage in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus, um, actually in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, obviously, God's not telling us here to hate our parents, right? I mean, as we read the rest of the scriptures, as we get to know God and the way God thinks and the way he moves, uh, God is, and Jesus is not telling us that we are to hate our father and our mother. But what Jesus is saying is that our commitment and our love to him, our obedience to him, that he's to be number one in our lives, that in comparison to our relationship with God up here, that the other relationships in life, mother and father and husband and wife and children and friends, that, that there is to be this gap, there is to be this span, that uh, hopefully there is a, a difference in the way we love God and the way we love other people, that is to be a total commitment. So uh, I just want to bring that up because that passage is often brought up Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, and people want to know, how is it that God can hate? He doesn't hate. It's just an expression of a contrast in behavior. Let's look at the 28th chapter. We'll get started here. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now notice here that as Jacob is preparing to leave, that at least the relationship is decent enough that the father gives Jacob a blessing. Now remember, Jacob is the one that just deceived him. A few days before this, or a few weeks before this, Jacob deceived his father, and, and we found that Isaac reacted violently and, and was very upset at this. And yet, as he leaves, he's able I think there's some forgiveness here, don't you? I think when you look at the fact that Jacob uh, receives this blessing from his father, I think we see that there is some love there between the two of them. Now, 
Isaac gives some specific instructions. You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, but arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful, multiply you, that you become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you. Remember, that blessing was where Abraham, wherever he looked, if he looked up at the sky above, all the stars, if he had his head down, the dust of the earth, that God was going to make a great nation out of Abraham. And that was the promise that is now being renewed to Jacob. Now, as I close here, I want to share with you the verse where it states, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And in the Old Testament and also in the New, there are prohibitions of God's people marrying people from other nations. Now, I know if I said that on the news media today, the first thing before I could even clarify, people would say, well, pastor, you're racist. What do you mean? You only marry your own kind. Well, this is very significant, and there's a significant difference here. God is not telling his people not to marry people from other nations because of their race has nothing to do with race. God so loved the world. Jesus died for the sins of the world. But in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is a prohibition of spiritual people, God-loving people, God-believing people, marrying people of another faith, those who, particularly in the Old Testament, worshipped many other gods. We read later in the Old Testament about the god of Baal. And uh, God's prohibition here is based uh, not upon race, but it's based upon the spiritual condition. In the New Testament, the New Testament says that believers should not be yoked, joined with unbelievers. And Paul says, what does light and darkness have in common? And so as we read through both the Old and New Testament, there is no prohibition against marrying someone of a different race <clears throat> or a different culture. It happens all the time. However, we are not to be unequally yoked that the spiritual faith that we have in our family, in our lives, that we are to find another person who has the spiritual values and the spiritual faith that we have that our house might be blessed. Well, listen, it's been good to uh, be able to do this through the miracle of uh, technology. And each week, if you will check online on our Facebook and homepage, we will continue in our book of uh, Genesis. I would also remind you that our services here at Westminster Presbyterian Church will also be posted on Facebook and on our webpage. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the many lessons. Lord, may we truly learn from the mistakes of your people that we would not repeat them. Lord, help us to study, to study your word, to show ourselves approved unto God, not ashamed, but rightly handling the word of truth. Lord, bless us and guide us and heal us by your power in Jesus' name. Amen.